Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of the Mini Medical School, a focus on global health organized by the University of Minnesota's Center for Global Health and Social Responsibility and the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs. A whole lot of people have put a lot of effort in organizing the, my personal thanks to the team for doing this. I'm Shaili Prasad, the Executive Director for the Center for Global Health and Social Responsibility, and your guide today and throughout our mini medical school. I want to start today by acknowledging Indigenous Peoples Day. Today is a very important day in recognizing the importance of Indigenous populations around the world. We are excited to have you here today, and we look forward to navigating you through our second topic of the series, Global Health is Local Health, Connecting Global Health to the Health of Minnesota. Today's session is a moderated discussion with a Q&A to follow. The session will be recorded and will be available for you to review by tomorrow on our Canvas site. Please note that our previous session from a week ago is already on the Canvas site, and the one next week on global health research will also be on the Canvas site. I encourage you to review the material on the Mini Medical School Canvas site for additional information in this and our other sessions. Again, this is the second of our three sessions and we welcome you to our next session next week too. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting a panel that will discuss global health in a local context. People often think that global health takes place somewhere else, traveling to distant lands, you know, in a very exotic location. When in fact, many people are working in global health in our own backyard. According to the last US census, Minnesota has the largest number of refugees per capita in the country. Refugee and migrant health is a pertinent priority for us at our Center for Global Health and Social Responsibility. We work with the UN Migration Agency by implementing a training program for health providers abroad to ensure that the US bound refugees receive proper health screening, arrive safely, and have a very successful community integration. I'm particularly excited about our panelists today. They will take this kind of work and they've been doing this for years and they're collaborating with organizations that work with local communities of migrants in Minnesota, immigrants in Minnesota to help reduce health inequities. Let's keep in mind that the primary tenet in global health is about achieving health and equity to all. It is in this context that we should keep in mind the underserved communities around us too. Another important issue that comes up is about global health paradigms. The challenges of underserved care in the US too, and how this closely parallels some of the conversations in global health and in the global local arena. The University of Minnesota is uniquely positioned to make a difference in this arena. We are one of the few universities that have six health sciences schools, medicine, public health, dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, and veterinary medicine. Other university programs beyond the traditional health sciences also empower our global health work very strongly. And these include, and not exclusively these, biological and social sciences, agriculture, public policy, engineering, and communications. We also have partners all around the state of Minnesota, all around this country and the world. So a quick poll, how many of Minnesota's health professionals are trained at the University of Minnesota? And I'm going to give you a few seconds to answer that poll. That's good. A lot of people are trending towards the right answer. It's about 70%. 70% of Minnesota's health professionals are trained at the University of Minnesota. This is why our center works to provide global health experience and education for researchers and students at the University of Minnesota to provide them with a global perspective on health as they move into working in Minnesota's communities and communities around the world. Last week, we emphasized the importance of us all living in an interconnected world. Our Global Medical Education Research Program or GMER within the med school,
provides the opportunity for our medical students to gain an immersive experience in a research or clinical setting in different countries of the world. For the past many years, more than 440 medical students have participated in this program. We have long-term programs, including one at the Mufangano Community Health Field Station on Lake Victoria in Kenya, or the Research Training Collaborative in Uganda. And some of our local programs include Global Health Case Competition, a unique opportunity for students from different schools and disciplines to come together to form innovative solutions for 21st century global health issues. You can learn more about our programs at globalhealth.umn.edu. And again, if you have questions for the panelists or me, please type it in the Q&A box and I will post it to a panelist. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists. I'm gonna start with Dr. Mike Westerhouse. Dr. Westerhouse is an assistant professor in the global medicine program here at the University of Minnesota, where he teaches social medicine and utilizes experiential and action-based methods to elevate the critical consciousness of health professionals. This is a very important skills for health professionals to develop early in their training. Dr. Westerhouse is also a primary care clinician at the Center for International Health, where he seeks to bear witness to the lived experience of refugees in order to support their efforts to overcome barriers to health. He also leads several programs with the aim of understanding and responding to structural forces in society that create poor health and health inequities. We at our center are lucky to have him because he leads our global health in a local context course, an experiential course, that places considerable importance on building partnerships and encourages students to reflect upon their personal experiences with power, privilege, race, class, and gender as central to effective partnership building in the health professions. This course is not only available to graduate and professional students at the university, we also welcome learners from the Twin Cities community to apply to take this course as well. Dr. Westerhouse, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work in global health, particularly in a local context? Yeah, great. Thanks for the introduction, Shiley, and really nice to be here <clears throat> tonight with you all and with our other panelists, um, whom I'm excited to learn from. Um, I, in terms of my little bit of my own story, I'm from Minnesota. I grew up in rural Minnesota, um, outside of St. Cloud. Um, came from a family of educators. My mom, first grade school teacher. My dad is a public school administrator for many years. I'm a dad, four daughters. I'm wrestling with virtual home learning in our public schools these days. Um, and uh, I'm married to a sociologist, which influences certainly my um, view that the social sciences are so important in the work that we do. Um, I trained in global health equity in Boston and in primary care and moved back here to Minnesota about 10 years ago now and <clears throat> practiced primary care at a clinic called the Center for International Health, which is a <clears throat> one of the largest refugee resettlement um, screening clinics in the state of Minnesota. So we partner very closely with the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, but largely the bulk of what we do is long-term primary care. Um, the clinic's been open for nearly 40 years. Um, and I love that part of my work. I love clinical work in the ways that it keeps me grounded, um, the ways it keeps me really in touch with people's stories and helps me reflect on my own story as well. Um, and then the other part of what I do is um, teaching social medicine, which is really getting folks thinking about these larger social forces and the ways in which um, those impact health. And that was something that I found to be very deficient in my own medical training. And so in the midst of my global health equity residency, I was in, in Uganda at the time and sort of co-designed with some Ugandan colleagues, a course that's now been running for 10 years, which really centers story, it centers thinking about social justice, and it really works to draw on the wisdom of the social sciences, as well in terms of informing understandings of health. So, and then as you mentioned, about five years ago, we, we implemented, we took that version of that course and run one here in the Twin Cities, which has been, um, which has been really moving to be part of, uh, in, uh, just learning so much about the history here and how that pertains to health. Thank you, Dr. Westers. I, I really appreciate your emphasis on the social aspects of it and how you are trying to integrate it into pretty much every work that you do. 
Uh, and then talking about uh, social aspects, I would like to bring our next panelist who has integrated a lot of this and the wealth of experience, particularly in working in communities, uh, Dr. Duvedi. Dr. Roli Duvedi is a assistant professor of family medicine at the University of Minnesota uh, Department of Family Medicine and Community Health, and also the chief clinical officer at the Community University Healthcare Center or the Cook Clinic in the, at the University of Minnesota. Approximately 81% of the 11,000 patients at the care center are uh, identify as a person of color, an immigrant, a refugee, or a Native American. Significant portions of their clientele live below the federal poverty level and are either uninsured or significantly underinsured. The majority of these folks cope with more than one chronic illness and nearly half receive some kind of mental health service. Dr. Duvedi is an educator who likes to create new models of teaching and culturally competent care delivery models. And she's at the forefront of implementing these too. Her interest in education includes global health and culturally sensitive care. She's developed a wonderful course for residents to understand global health in a local context. And she works towards improving health disparities in addition to mentoring medical students and residents. Dr. Duvedi, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about yourself and your work in global health in a local context. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Um, first, I would like to take a moment to repeat the thing that you said that we are sitting, standing on Dakota land. So we have to just uh, take a moment um, to be blessed and to be thankful to be here. There's a lot of work on health inequities that need to be done. And we as a collective force has to continue doing that work to improve the health of all of our communities, especially our indigenous communities. Speaking of myself, um, I'm Roli Dwavadi, um, originally from India, um, from the north part of the India. There was no plan in my picture to come to Minnesota, but it happened 20 years ago, I landed here. Um, and then I got trained um, in uh, family medicine here at the University at the Smiley's Clinic. Um, and then I um, started working at the Cook Clinic. Um, I started as a physician, then became a medical director and then a chief clinical officer. Um, even before coming to Minnesota, serving the underserved population was my passion. Um, I worked as a medical director in, um, in a rural setting in India, which is a charitable hospital serving the underserved population. Um, and currently at Cook, which is a federally qualified healthcare center um, located in Minneapolis. Um, and um, as Dr. Said, Dr. Prasad said that um, I, when I came here, I was very curious because I started learning about this new terminology, global health, and all the students are going to the different countries to learn the global health. And, and then I was looking at Cook Clinic, uh, working there, and I, this thought just came to me like pretty much every single day, global health is here, right here in Minnesota. Uh, we can do a lot here. Uh, and actually we need to do a lot here so that we can work on improving the knowledge and the skills and attitude to serve the commu global communities. Um, so at, at, at Cook, um, as Dr. Prasad said, we, we serve um, patients from 12 different racial and ethnic communities. So over the years, we have um, done a lot of work at Ku Clinic. And when it comes to um, serving the global communities, the things that come to my mind are the looking at the space, the type of the care, the collaboration that to need to happen and the education. And those are the four pillars that we have been focusing on. Um, especially when we are serving the global communities, I think the trust is the biggest factor. And once the trust is developed, then we can provide the patient-centered care. So, and trust building starts with the space, um, how you build the space, and then the trust builds the care and the collaboration and the education. Um, so, so we have done a tons of work in, in looking at um, making sure that we are the, at every single level at the, at the clinic, in starting from the front desk to the support staff, to the providers, to the collaborators, we are representing the communities that we are serving. So um, all of our staff at the front desk speak the languages that we serve. 
Um, all our CMAs speak the languages that we serve. Uh, more than 50% of our staff is bilingual. More than 50% of our medical providers who um, they are um, uh, bilingual. We make sure that we have a cultural brokers um, at different location in the clinic so that the people feel welcome. Um, and then what we have done is that the Fed, what happens is that the federally qualified healthcare center are the first step when a person, we serve a lot of refugee immigrant population. So when they come, the federally qualified healthcare center are the first door to entry to the care. Uh, a lot of time they might not even have the insurances. So it is very important from the FQHC perspective to build a care model, which is more holistic and whole person care. Um, so we have all service lines, which include includes not only the medical, we, we also have a psychiatry and the therapy and wraparound services, which is case management and arms. We have a dental onsite, midwifery, we have a legal clinic and also the domestic um, um, assault and the sexual assault victim advocate. So basically looking at a person from the, uh, which can not only do the, the, just the medical model, but the holistic care model that's the thing that is very important we are when we are serving um serving the the populations and then we have developed a lot of uh, curriculum that Dr. Rasad was saying that global health in local context curriculum we developed uh, a cu curriculum for the preceptor because um uh, we identified that we need to develop a lot of, we needed, we had a lot of gap in our knowledge and the skills in serving different communities. Acculturation needed to be um, um, learned by the providers and the staff members. So we created something called CPEDS, which is um, Cook Preceptor Enrichment Model. We, we did that for a few years and we developed a module of like, if you see a patient, what are the questions to ask, how to ask the questions, when to ask the questions. Uh, we, we developed a model for um, a student where, because we cannot provide a came when care when there is a, not a team-based care. So we, we created a structured learning experiences for our students. Um, but the, bar, the, the most important thing is that the clinic has a governing board, which has more than 50% uh, patients. And we also are very, very, uh, and our board is, is the one who sets the strategic priorities, how we should be serving our patient, what are the clinical care that need to happen. We also have the patient advisory who meets every month and gives the feedback if the care needs to be tweaked. Um, so, um, for me, in my mind, uh, global health is beyond just the chronic disease or the infectious disease. It is, um, it is uh, way more than that. Um, it is about um, how we see person as an individual, the person that you're serving in front of you. And that's the thing that we have been trying over the years um, and have developed several models. Um, and hopefully we'll be talking some, about some of those later in, the, in this uh, platform. Thank you, Dr. Duvedi, I appreciate that. I appreciate your emphasis on how all those um, structures are interrelated and can move beyond the global to the local context. Uh, now a third uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Maria Veronica Suetas. Um, she's a cisgender immigrant Latinx family physician at the Hennepin Healthcare Department of Family Medicine and Community Medicine and a faculty of the Leadership Education in Adolescent Health in the Department of General Peds at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Suetas is originally from Argentina, but she designed and directs what's called Aki Parati, Here For You, a youth development program with some fabulous wraparound service. And she's been doing this since 2002. This was originally funded by the Eliminating Health Disparities Initiatives Grant from the Minnesota Department of Health. She's also developed a system-wide program called Hene Team, now named Between Us, to create comprehensive spaces for teens, teens and their parents, and both teens, parents, and providers. Her research focuses on creating inclusive programs, caring for immigrants and refugees, racism and its effect on health, parenting youth of color, and health equity for teens, their families, and the communities. I've seen her work shine both in the Society of Adolescent Health, in family medicine, and in world organizations. Dr. Swetas, can you please tell us a little more about yourself and your work in global health in a local context?
Dr. Suetas, I'm going to ask you to unmute first, sorry. Thank you. I thought that you would magically, centrally organizing that. So like with the magic wand, bling. Don't so have much magic. <laughs> I have the magic wand. So my name is Maria Veronica Suetas and I'm, I'm an immigrant from Argentina. The, it was very interesting for me to find myself becoming an immigrant. Uh, and that was not certainly what I was like thinking about or expecting when I, like, when I was growing up. And being an immigrant somehow was really, really ingrained into my identity in Argentina because I was the, in Argentina, we, we talk about that, right? Like there's a lot of, has, we have a lot of migration coming from Eastern European and Italy and Spain. And that created kaleidoscope of, cultures and certainly I, I was one of those right so I have like the the phenotypic pieces of the Eastern European but the passion of the Italian and Spania right and I have all of them mixed together some, somewhere on my genes so I was born in a rural area which I think is also significantly how that informs the work on global health somehow because somehow you you become from the little neat of a small community, and then you become this global citizen. So it's those many transitions that you do, right? From the rural to the city, to the city, to the world. And I came to the United States 1996 because I was an internal medicine physician. My dream was to do family medicine. So I came to do like, like a three months rotation on my last year of internal medicine to do family medicine and to do adolescent health. And I landed here in Minnesota because I wanted to do adolescent health, but I wanted to do become some sort of like having like a subspecialty about adolescents with chronic illness and special needs, which I'll talk about that later on, 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 my, on, on my journey through the night. But um, I think that has a, a tremendous influence uh, being from Argentina, being from Latin America, and, and having that, that uh, lens of becoming from the South, right? So talking about global health equity and that understanding that when you're coming from the South Hemisphere, there's a different lens, right? And you, you already know, you felt it, the, the inequity lens around the globe. And I think that prepared us in a different way. I also came from a country who was at moments taken by the military government. So that gives you like a different also lens about your, your mission and, and, and the work that you need to do in the community. So I came, I did my fellowship at the same uh, division of General Pitts that I'm now faculty. And somehow when I finished my fellowship, I decided that I needed to go work, that I wanted to go work on, on places where Healthcare was sort of like part of the of the kind of human health right, right? That you didn't have an insurance. So it, it needed to be an FQAC or it needed to be a hospital in Hennepin who, who will have some sort of like ability to, to support that vision. And, and being there, I think like I became sort of like the witness about what it really, really means. At that moment, we didn't have that definition. We didn't even have the definition of social determinant of health. But I, we all got that understanding about we are the witness of where people live, learn, grow, and educate themselves and fight through all kinds of adversity to become the best person that they can. And that witnessing, I think, informed how I wanted to create and, and what, what, what I wanted to do. So health equity became suddenly like a, like a real thing. And, so one of the things that, that I've done, it's creating a, a, creating a program that really reflected sort of like the health equity mission that you do something for your young community within the community and, and using the community values. And I love the definition when Rolly was saying like, spaces is everything, right? So we talk about in, in that creation of inclusive spaces, we call, we call it, welcoming empathy. So we wanted to create that program, that space where like a family will come and see reflected on the components on, of the program, those 
values and preferences that they have and they resonate with their culture and they resonate with their concept of healthcare. And we did it in a way sort of like proofing the program, kind of like knowing what were the main challenges like our youth and our family will have with, with the idea of not a preventive diseases, right? Like Rolly was saying, with the idea is like, how can we propel this individual to be the best, the best self that that person can be? How can we unleash their potential to become, to, to achieve those dreams that they want to conquer because we know like in the end that when you do that, that's what creates helps. When you follow your dream and you work in the career that it's your passion, when you were able to educate yourself and conquer that job that you wanted to be, that's what make you healthy. So, um, and that was the whole intention. And, and I think I was prepared, I'm going to mention something quickly about when I was at the University of Minnesota getting my master in public health, I remember uh, Michael Resnick in a, in a class, he presented a work, an article. You, I'm sure like, uh, Shelly, you know the article. So it's an article that the ED, the Bronx uh, ED department creating about measuring sort of like index of health in the community five miles from the ED and contrasting those measurements with Bangladesh, with at those moment, I think 1997, 1988, have the highest index of poverty and showing that it was the same or worst. And in the end, they were saying like, why would you go to pursue health equity kind of like around the globe when you can do the same, not so fancy, right? But around the block and exactly the same, the same context that you were describing, Shari. Thank you, Dr. Suetas. I really appreciate that. I think the premise that in global health, we need to be looking at health equity as a primary lens, I think is a huge part. And I really appreciate all three of you bringing that point up. Uh, Dr. Westerhaus, you mentioned you know, your experience when you developed the course in Uganda. Was it a single aha moment or was it a series of events that slowly evolved in you particularly in applying your frameworks, you know, the global health frameworks while working in communities here in Minnesota? Yeah, great question. I, well, I think there was, uh, there was definitely an aha moment for thinking about what these kinds of global health principles mean here in the Twin Cities. So I had spent, the course in Uganda started in 2010 and um, we spent four or five years really working on what is like core content that we think health professionals should be learning that's not included in our training on social determinants, structural determinants. Um, and then we were spending a lot of time learning like how do you teach this? Like what kind of pedagogy do you use to really engage people? And got to the point where after about five years of feeling like really proud of, excited, feeling like we had something we were, that was just like super, and the aha moment for me was when I was here in the Twin Cities sharing about our course, um, kind of narrating, here's what we include, here's the pedagogy, here's what's happening to students who have taken it the course. Someone in the audience, I remember very well, stopped and asked, um, not in too threatening of a way, but in a critical way, this course sounds great. Why are you not teaching it in your own community? And for me, that um, that really started uh, for the whole team of us, like kind of a reckoning with like really thinking about who am I, where am I from? Um, what are the ways in which these things that we're, we've been talking about and looking at in Northern Uganda, things like the impact of neoliberal policy on minimizing access to public health services, thinking about a history of colonialism, in British colonialism in Northern Uganda. Like, why have we not been thinking critically about those things here in the Twin Cities? And that kind of, that was a major aha moment that kind of launched a, a few years of working with the center, working with many different folks in the community to really co-design this course that we started now four years ago. Um, and I think for me, the aha was like, I had really in global health built an, an identity on going away. Mm -hmm. me being someone who's from Minnesota, like go, global health is always going away somewhere. Um, and I think when we're doing that, when we're always going away to other places, it can be really easy to 
kind of exclude yourself mm -hmm. from the purview of analysis? Like how, how are all these same kinds of things playing out in a community that I might, that I'm from where there might be greater accountability for your actions, um, probably greater opportunities really mentioned the importance of trust to like build long-term relationships with people um, and, to, and to be able to make yourself vulnerable in those spaces. Thank you. I mean, that was quite profound. I think we all have gotten stories like that when we compare, you know, for me, it was looking at teen pregnancy rates and forest tribes in India to teen pregnancy rates in urban populations here in the US and they're pretty similar. It's quite telling when you're like, whoa, there's a lot of similarity. Dr. Duvivedi, I'm going to bring you in here, and you talked a little bit about your background, particularly coming from Northern India. How much has that framed your thoughts in this? And was there a single aha moment, or was it a series of events that built you up to where you are right now? Um, I, I, I had several aha moments, and um, even though I teach global uh, health, and I practice global health, but still every single day I have aha moments. Um, and it's like every day I'm just like, oh my gosh, uh, why didn't I think about it? Uh, but the, the clearly I can think about, I think it was around 2011 or 2012, um, I was taking care of a, of a lady who was originally from Somalia and um, she, had a, she had a very poorly controlled diabetes. And um, she, during that visit, she just uh, told me that she was planning to fast for 30 days for Ramadan. Uh, and then she also was telling me about the recurrent episode of like blood, low blood sugars. And, and that moment, it just hit me so hard. It just made me realize, oh my gosh, what I have been just doing so far in my life. There was such a gap in the knowledge and the skills I had in, in serving the global communities. Um, I, I had the knowledge how to treat the diabetes, um, uh, but I needed to modify that knowledge and, and needed to provide the patient-centered care, which was uh, meeting the need of the global communities. The other things that I have learned over the years is um, how, how the mental illness presents um, and interpreted in different communities, in different global communities, and how do I engage the different global communities. Um, another thing that I can think about the addiction issues in different communities. Um, so, I mean, I, can, I have a very long list of things. Uh, and Every time I am, um, and I keep adding to the list and I see, oh my gosh, I read the textbook. I have so much knowledge, but I didn't develop that skill. How do I modify that knowledge according to the person who's sitting in front of me? And uh, I grew up, I, I was in North India. A lot of people do Ramadan in North India, do the fasting, but I was, I, the healthcare providers and the healthcare systems are so narrow focused and narrow laned that we never broaden our horizon or never broaden our mind to be more inclusive of the global communities or the global needs. And working with in, in last 10 years or 11 years, I think just having with learning from each interaction, each patient a story, I think, uh, uh, I, I want to say that over the years, it has shaped my practice style. It has shaped my brain. I think my brain is rewired and restructured in thinking a little bit differently. How do I provide care to this particular individual and meet the needs of this individual who is sitting in front of me? Thank you, Dr. Duvedi. I really appreciate the point you brought about we're all learning as we go, right? It seems like every encounter we have with a patient, particularly when the cultural context is different, every time I feel like I've learned something new that I need to start practicing again. Uh, Dr. Swetas, how about you? Was there a specific aha moment? And particularly in the context of that wraparound service and creating community that you talked about. So for me, in Paris, like what, the same thing that Raleigh is mentioning, right? Like it's, it's that continuous learning and thank God for that learning, right? Because we amuse, we get innovating and, and sucking that information from, from our patients and our family, right? So it's fascinating. But one of the, I don't know if it was an, an aha moment, but it was like a learning, but I remember at the same time, like that vivid experience of feeling like, like an epiphany, like an aha moment, right? Like thinking, 
at a moment when, when we were designing, by the time, I think it was 2001, I have like six years of being a faculty, but I have like three years of working with the community. So I was doing my residency at Richmond Hospital and my, my main clinic with Westside Community Health Services in West St. Paul with the longest Latino enclave in Minnesota. So how, how amazing is that? To be training on the place that you probably would have been working if you were not training. So, so it was such a fascinating speed of learning and also full, feeling fulfilled, feeling like I, I was bringing my work to someone who really kind of like value that, value that. And when, again, you are on the trenches and you are witnessing what people have to go through in, in this unequal society, at some point when I was writing the grant for the Eliminating Health Disparity Initiative, that kind of like push you kind of like to have that lens. But at some point, my reflection was like, what's the difference between having a chronic condition with having a chronic illness? What's the difference? Particularly, not only on the burden, right, on your health, but also on how you manage that. And so that's what I was saying before, like, I will come back, I will come back to this, right? So I came to train on teens and chronic illnesses and special needs. So I learned healthcare models and how teamwork, it's the way to go. And I said, that's what we need. So we need a team, a teamwork. We should have a healthcare model around what we now know as social determinant of health. So that was totally my aha moment. And I put it kind of like in practice, just, just translating knowledge from one side to the other, right? And, and then we got the name, social determinant of health. And then we got kind of like the, the fancy way of talking about these issues, but the concepts were the same. The other aha moment that, that, I, that is still, and you just mentioned that by, by don't know why, but it's, there I am in the Society of Adolescent Health and Medicine, the Lancet Commission, like since 2012 and 2016, put like a panel working on global adolescent metrics. So they're presenting the map of the world uh, with all these outcomes and indicators about child, childhood health indicator, right? And you can see those in red on the South and United States. And you can see Latin America and United States being the same color. So I, I kind of raised my hand and I went there to the microphone and like, just a reflection, right? And it seems to me like we have been divided health at a global level by developed and developed countries, by kind of like money, by GPD, instead of using the Guinness, the, the real influencer of how a country does is how unequal they are. Mm -hmm. And that map was it. And, and I think like more and more we are learning that. Like it doesn't matter how much as to be a developed or undeveloped country, the, the way of measuring that and how that impact will come in, into your own healthcare system will not depend on that, but will depend on how unequal or equal you are in your community. That's, that's a beautiful point. I think, um, if anything, and I know there'll be questions on this, COVID has laid this bare a little more, uh, how we are in unequal societies as far as healthcare and healthcare access is concerned. Um, I really appreciate you folks' uh, uh, background and how you approach global health in a local context. I'd like to expand on this a little more. Um, Dr. Westerhouse, I would like to get a little more back, uh, background particularly on the intersection of global and local health. You mentioned your course in Uganda, and I know you have a course uh, that you have worked in Haiti on too, and the course here. In all of this, how has the intersection of global and local health manifested itself? Yeah, um, great question. And one I think a lot about, I, I, I feel like when we, utilize the terms even global and local, I've started to find myself recognizing how important it is to pause and just think about like, what does that mean to you? Like what maps into your mind when you talk about global health versus local health? And I think for me, and I think for many, we still are stuck in these ways of thinking about global health as somewhere else, some other place um, and local health somehow being nearby. And I, I, for me, one, a real lesson, something I've been thinking a lot about is because those terms are kind of geographic in a, in a way, 
like when we're thinking about global and local, it's really important for us to know and um, it, it, and think about place the places in which we are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think even today, starting off and recognizing that um, it's Indigenous Peoples Day and like naming the land, the history, the space is so critically important. So for me, I you know, place based is really important. And when I when I talk about that now, I'm thinking about like what is the connection to the land. What do we know about history in that space? What do we not know about it? What are the relationships that we have with people? Um, for me as well, I think like, again, back to that mental mapping exercise, I think when we use those words, global, local, it also makes you realize how um, profoundly personal that is as well, because what is global for someone might be local for someone else or some really interesting things I have observed in Northern Uganda where I will be rounding next to a colleague of mine um, uh, who's from Uganda and people will consider me to be doing global health, but not my Ugandan colleague, even though we're doing the same thing on the ward. So I think then that starts to get us deeper unpacking, like where does this come from? How are we naming things and, and what kinds of forces are part of those things? And I, like for me, I think the exciting part of global local is there's possibility in that. There's the possibility of collaboration, cooperation, learning from things that are happening all over the world. And there's also great hazard because when we start to demarcate certain places this and certain places that, I've seen some very um, unfortunate things happen in global health as well, where you're like setting different standards for different places, whether it's research you're doing or clinical standards. And um, so, that's a little bit of a theoretical answer in a way, but I, I just think there's a lot in that when we start talking global, local, and like, it's really important to think, what do I mean by those definitions? And how am I personally like connected to those? What is that raising in my own imagination when I use that, that terminology? <clears throat> I really appreciate that point, particularly because from the conversations that are occurring right now in the field of global health, there is a heavy emphasis on decolonizing global health, not so much as doing unto them something, but making it more bi-directional, making it as a learning experience for all of us. So having that in mind. I'd like to bring one other point, and we've had this conversation before. You have emphasized the importance of social determinants of health in this whole uh, framework too. Um, can you give a few examples of what the social determinants of health would, how these would impact the well-being of folks in our neighborhoods and around the world? Yeah, great. So I, um, you know, I think one thing, a, a learning for me in this global local work is I think really what are global are a set of social and structural forces that have a huge impact on health. And when we're talking, when I'm talking about structural forces, thinking about things like racism and settler colonialism and patriarchy and racial capitalism. And those are forces that are being experienced in different ways, but are nonetheless um, heavily impactful on health. So like examples, I, the two places I know best if I'm thinking about like Northern Uganda and Minnesota. In Northern Uganda, in the time when I was spending much more time practicing primary care there, the impact of a 20 year war um, in the ways in which that and also defunded public health systems due to like World Bank policies in the 1980s, that had like real repercussions for people like in their bodies. I mean, it, you can think obviously like the connection between something like being in a war setting and post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, defunded public health systems end up leaving people without access to care or waiting to seek care until they've got very advanced disease. So that turns into very complicated malaria, diarrheal disease in Northern Uganda. Here in Minnesota, um, when you think about like, how do those larger social forces set the conditions for health for people? We see, we have histories of redlining, mm -hmm. residential segregation that still happens today, underfunded public education systems, mm -hmm. um, job insecurity, all of those things, again, set up social conditions that lead to uncontrolled diabetes, 
severe COVID infection. You mentioned COVID a little earlier, which is like the elephant in the room right now, because we see all of these things playing out and affecting our most vulnerable populations. <clears throat> um, Dr. Svetas, would you like to add anything to what Dr. Westerhouse mentioned, particularly about the intersection of global and local health and the context of social determinants here? Dr. Svetas, can you unmute, please? <laughs> I'm fighting this with, with this thing. So um, I was just also thinking of, and reflecting like when you say local, sometimes local, there's a lot of belonging there, the local. When you're playing two matches, the local has the people cheering for you because you belong, you are, you are so, and the power that is there, right? Like who is the local and who represents the local? And, and exactly what you're saying, the local can be totally global, right? That's what we are seeing. And I think that's what happened with globalization somehow, like somehow like communities are now colorful and are totally different the com communities kind of co-living together. So um, we totally have seen, I'll, I'll say like a, the, 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 in the 2008 since um, the global recession, the economical global recession, we have seen so like that, that trend from, from globalization to nationalism, right? And I think one of the things that, just to add to the equation that we have lived and seen in Akiparati was the impact of that. And so we know like with this shift in, in it came anti-immigrant policies that were really clear and they were really uh, loud. And, and I think like, Part of what we tried to do in the recent year was like to, to see the differences and the impact of that health in our children. So how the, the political and social economical context have impacted our teens in Akiparati. And we saw, we have been measuring anxiety and depression for the last 15 years. And so the level was high and that's a disparity for Latino teens. And we are equipped kind to contrarrest that piece or, or at least take care of that. And suddenly we saw in the last three years an increase like three times higher mm -hmm. to, to a point never before. But at the same time, we saw family separation, forced family separation in our backyard increased mm -hmm. eight times more. So when you put that into context and the global local, right? My family locally ripped it apart and send it to the other side of the border when now I become to have like a transnational family, but some of the members don't have that ability to globalize their family experience because some, some of them, they can, they can leave. So the last year have marked profoundly, uh, even before COVID, how policies and, and um, different contexts in policy can make or break the well-being of a community. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Duvedi, um, I've been observing a lot of the work that you've been doing at Cook, and I know this year has brought its own challenges, not that you didn't have challenges before. It seems like the COVID situation has worsened or made some of the inequities much more stronger. Um, in many ways, it's almost like the COVID pandemic is highlighting these inequities much more starkly in terms of people dying or having trouble accessing care and things like that. Um, can you describe a few examples of health interventions or programs here in Minnesota that are addressing these social determinants of health and working towards health equity, uh, including what's happening at your clinic? And how are they making a difference in communities? Sure. Um, so, um... COVID-19 is one, but I also want to take this opportunity to name um, the unfortunate event of murder of Mr. Floyd, which happened that that added thing mm -hmm. and it just made it, um, uh, so there's just so much trauma. So I wanted to name it because there's, that's another layer of complexity. And I wanted, I, I wanted to name it because I serve a lot of Haitians who come from uh, who have a, who come as a refugee and immigrant and have the lived experience of trauma and war. So my patients were feeling that we, and I'm still feeling with the COVID that we are in a war. 
So we're not only treating the disease or the COVID-19, but we are treating, or we are trying to address, uh, as I said, the whole person care. Um, when that happened, we needed to do a food donation drive in our parking lot and 250 people showed up because they were thinking and they were grabbing food from my other hands, thinking that we are in war, there will be no food. So what we have done since the COVID-19 that we have a collaboration with open arm um, uh, organization who can deliver food to the people who um, who don't have who have food insecurities. So there are a lot of organizations who are looking at these structural inequities or the barriers or the institutional um, um, inequities and trying to work towards making care accessible accessible or trying to make things available to the populations which actually make a difference. Um, like we have. Um, we have a partnership with the legal clinic. We have a legal clinic at Cook, and that actually was the first niche, first clinic in the nation which is affiliated with the healthcare or with the health clinic. And what it does is that if um, if someone has a question or a concern, because we see a lot of patients who come in, come in with as a, either as an asylum seeker or even with the COVID nineteen, I know a lot of our patients um, do the public charges. They have um, this fear that if I seek care, um, if I get the diagnosis of COVID-19, I might be deported. So having a legal clinic or services in place, at, that's a reassurance for them or it is a reassurance for the healthcare provider to bring them, no, we have your back. You come to us, we have your back. So they, they, they provide the pro bono legal services to our patient and that's very helpful. Um, the other organization that I can think of is the, we, we know that um, a lot of our patients um, uh, experience homelessness. So we, we have, um, we uh, had a partnership, we know that there are several hotels which were trained, which were changed into the homeless shelter. So our care coordinators were uh, collaborating with those hotels. And if someone had a COVID-19 positive diagnosis and didn't have a place to live, they will be connecting with the authorities and there will be, there were beds reserved for those big folks to go in there. Um, there are, um, there are, um, telemedicine is another example. I know we have done a lot of advocacy around telemedicine. It, it is a, tele, telemedicine has a, has a good point of access, but also there are inequities attached with the telemedicine. So we have been advocating for the phone visits rather than the virtual visit, because a lot of our patients, um, especially um, might not have a good internet might not have an iPad, might not have a computer. So we have been working with the systems um, and advocating so that we just heard the news today that, that it is extended until January, 2021, but we needed to be, at, we needed to collaborate with other community clinics. There are 17 in Minnesota and advocate for this issue so that our patients have access. The other thing that I can think of is the uh, Clues is an organization which is a Latina-led nonprofit organization. It was founded in 1981. Um, it provides culturally, culturally and linguistic relevant services to our um, Latina population, and they have a lot of services available. WellShare is another organization which is more focused, which is a 5013C. It has a lot of um, um, information. They are doing tons and tons of work around COVID education in the communities. They have created videos. I know I work with the PhDR department and one of our colleagues, she works with the, with the organization and they are culturally appropriate, sensitive, based on the health literacy um, education. Um, uh, we are educating different communities um, um, Somali communities, Hmong communities, and, uh, and Hispanic and Latino. I'm personally working with uh, like a lot of imams, um, having a meeting with them every week. Uh, there is a, a religion and health, uh, faith-based organization. So they are working a lot on the COVID-19. Um, there is a lot of organization, including Cook, we are thinking about mobile care. Over the years, over the years we have done, you come to us, we will give you the care. COVID is a, is a curse, but it is also a, an opportunity for us to pause, think, reflect upon, and develop a new model of care so that we can extend our hands and we can go to our patients and provide care at their door. 
where it is needed. So the right care is, can be provided to the right people at the right time and the changes can happen. So, I mean, I can talk all for next an hour, but there is a lot of strength in Minnesota. There's a lot of collaboration that can happen. There's a lot of opportunities that exist. We just need to reflect upon on those opportunities and sit tight and then work on those to improve the care. Thank you, Dr. Duvedi. I, I would like to actually emphasize one other point. The Minnesota Department of Health is considered to be the best state health department as far as immigrant populations are concerned. So I appreciate that. Dr. Westerhaus, I know of your work at the Center for International Health. Um, similar to the question I asked Dr. Duvedi, what are your partnerships like there and are there local organizations that you work with, either there or elsewhere, that you found to be really useful in um, working with immigrant populations? Yeah, thank you. Um, just to follow up on, I, I think it's, we have a strong partnership with the Minnesota Department of Health and their Refugee and International Health Office, um, particularly in the um, resettlement process of refugees who are just arriving to Minnesota. Um, and so that's been really an important relationship and then, uh, you know, with the clinic, uh, there are a lot in, we're based in St. Paul. And so it's really strong partnership with um, the Wilder Foundation and a number of the programs that they have. They run a center for social healing, um, which has been really an important space. Th that space is particularly um, uh, tailored for folks who are from Southeast Asia and, but do a lot of um, really important um therapies um, that I think really are supporting people as they're resettling and um, um, finding their space and their way around in the community. There's Vietnamese social services. Um, there's the Korean organization of Minnesota. So a lot of those are um, groups that um, are run by folks from those communities and are just a wealth of information, communication, and spaces for our patients to, to be able to get the many things outside of the medical care that we can provide in clinic, which are, again, when we're talking social determinants and you're thinking about all these other forces that affect health for people, it's really important to have community partners who are, who are really attentive to and very knowledgeable about how to support people in those ways. Dr. Svetas, what about you? Have you seen um, those collaborations and partnerships that you've seen to be really successful? So one of the most important pieces of health equity is like to learn not to reinvent the wheel, right? And, and, to, partner, and to partner to provide care because you are, so you are serving the, the whole person and you know and you're aware like the social determinant of health are the most important pieces, 40, 45% of what really means health. And we only give 10, 15% if so, when you do that switch, it's kind of like it all makes sense, right? So partnering with those people who are providing those services and are kind of like taking those barriers down for our patients are, are crucial. For me, it's kind of funny because really mentioned that too. For me, one of the most amazing partnership ever it was with legal aid. Mm -hmm. It's that partnership that you have with, with um, we have also uh, with the, uh, uh, human Rights Association, there's an immigrant uh, clinic uh, from, from a law perspective and partnering with lawyers, decreasing the burden of one of the most important determinants of health, which is immigration status and how that will become obstacles for them achieving the things that they need. And I remember once upon a time as a, as a little story, we partner with between Navigate and the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota. At the times, like DACA came to be, and they drafted a letter. Their lawyer drafted a letter where I, the physician, can say, "Hey, I'm the primary care provider from this team from day 2004 till now, and giving them the validity because they need to show proof." Like they were in Minnesota before being 16 year old. And one of the ways for them was like to bring the medical health record. Can you imagine, particularly a teenager with all the confidential care pieces that we have in the, in the, the stories on those charts. 
And signing that letter for me, I always say like, if there's one thing that I feel that was the most powerful intervention for me, it's when I have that, those letters in my hand and I was signing them and giving that to the patient. So talking about advocacy, I have goosebumps, see? Advocacy, extending your privilege, that. So those letters to me were it. Thank you, that was wonderful. I, I remember you telling me about your personal satisfaction in writing those letters too. Yeah. Um, now, here's a question for all three of you. Um, all of you are involved in education, uh, influencing the future workforce, a significant number of them who stay here in Minnesota or the upper Midwest. So from the educational framework, the work that you're doing, how is this going to affect folks who are going to work in rural Minnesota, for example, or taking care of an elderly population here in Minnesota? And why is it important for us to have that approach of you know, the health equity approach, the global local approach, and the premise of working the social determinants of health here in Minnesota. And I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Westerhaus. Yeah, um, well, I think uh, as we talked about earlier, like the, the fact that social determinants are things that have an impact regardless of location means that whether you're working here in St. Paul or Minneapolis, or you're in St. Cloud, or you're even in a smaller town, those same kinds of things are affecting um, the health of people. We know that like where people are living, working, going to school, um, all of those things are gonna have an, an impact on people's health. So I do think there is a really important general set of principles um, when I'm working with when I'm working with health professionals in training, which is really naming that and pointing out that um, despite the ways in which, and this is changing, but it, at least when I was in medical school, the ways in which really my training was all within the, the biological, or if you couldn't explain something biologically, then it must have something to do with a behavior problem that the person had. Um, when has been emphasized numerous times here, these larger social things, um, deserve much more recognition. So that, that's where for me, regardless of where someone's going to practice someday, I think um, imparting that, that sense, that orientation that we need to look outside of the, the body and the behavior of people is going to be really important. And I think the other lesson that comes up with that, the obvious thing that we just all were sharing about is how important like community partnerships are with like people who, I love that word belonging, with people who like can belong to that space, people who hold the wisdom of that area. Like it's so important if you're gonna go work somewhere where you're not from that you're really like orienting yourself, orient, like doing a much, a long orientation and relationship building with those people who are there um, because that's how you start to fill in, fill in the gaps. Sure. Mm -hmm. Dr. Suetas, how about you? I think it gives you, so we know, and we, we have that in Minnesota, we have that everywhere. Like there's these um, health inequity that are rural and city related, right? Where even growing up for us who, who grew up in the rural area, I remember like becoming to the university and hearing about opportunities that I never have a clue. My, 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 my high school never have a clue. We never have access uh, and, and it, keeps being reproduced over and over again, right? So we here in Minnesota, we have a clear uh, inequity. So bringing that lens, it's particularly important. And one thing that I, that I forgot to mention about like when, and when you go there, right? Even when the, the, the community is predominantly in one culture, I think like living in rural areas magnify the culture of the family, right? The, the culture of the micro center uh, of the family and how you need to learn and respect that. And the other thing that I wanted to, to stress, sometimes it's like we, we are partnering, we're partnering with communities just to, just to, for the synergy and, and, and to create more momentum all together. But I think it's also like we, we partner for ourselves because when you partner with someone, you don't feel alone. And I remember that feeling around 2000, and particularly with before that, right? That feeling about, despair, what can I do to support my teams when they don't have access to education? Because they came here to the United States when they were two months old. But I remember like when you, when you 
join the movement of people, then you don't, one, you don't feel alone, but also you feel, and that's what advocacy does for you, right? You feel like you are putting your little seed into the equation to make a change. And that helps you to decrease your own burnout. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, it's integral for us all to feel as part of a community. And when we are in the local communities that we work in, as many of us are, it's important to have the sense of belonging as providers too, not just as patients. Right. Absolutely. Dr. Duvedi, what about you? I'm, I'm so happy that you asked that question uh, because that's the question that I ask when my global local rotation is students start um, exiting. So when I do the exit interview, I ask them, so where, where are you planning to practice? Mm -hmm. and tell me how are you going to be using these experiences and implement that into that location. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think it is very important. Um, what happens is that a lot of communities come to Minnesota, you name it, refugee, immigrant, or, or like, however, they come here. They come to one location and then families start settling down to different location. And then the acculturation happens. And then um, kids are growing differently and the generation, other generations are gen, uh, growing differently. So culture shapes the meaning and culture shapes the understanding. And that's why I think it is very really important. It doesn't matter like where you will be, you need to understand how you will be, again, as I said, how are you gonna be treating this person who's sitting in front of you? It doesn't matter if you're in rural Minnesota because we have a lot of global communities in rural Minnesota. We have a lot of like plants where a lot of our global communities work. We have a lot of migrant health workers who come and work in our rural communities. So how do you equip yourself? So bringing the lens of um, culture, bringing the lens of social determinants of health, um, growing up, rural area, growing up rural area, I never had tennis shoes before I come to United States. I mean, truly, I never had tennis shoes. So I can truly relate when I see one of our old Somali female in cold winter wearing just the slippers and coming to the clinic and I need to educate about the diabetes and cold, but how it is, can be culturally sensitive and specific, acknowledging the fact and not being disrespectful. So all those are the models of like transitioning, welcoming our population who come from the different part of the world and helping them settle here, helping them understand what is the, what is the healthcare system. I never, <laughs> Even though I'm a primary care doctor, like, uh, but I travel to different parts of the globe, understanding of the primary care screening, it's not out there. A lot of a lot of countries, people don't understand what is the primary care. Right. People get confused here. People know checkup, but they don't know primary care screening. So how do we how do we how do we fill the gaps in the knowledge, skill, and attitudes? Um, not at the provider level, but also at the person who's sitting in front of us. How do we do the mutual learning and how do we create the care pathways? Thank you. And I think this is a perfect segue for us because the first question I'm going to pose is from Ryan, who says, uh, interesting to hear some feedback or perspective of how your patients from refugee and immigrant population feel about medical care and access to care they receive in the US versus their home countries. I, I can talk about that in the beginning if you want me to. Sure, please go ahead. A, a lot of our patients, so there are two, this, the mechanism that is used in our, a lot of our populations is that the, the mode of communication is talking to each other. Mm -hmm. People talk to each other, that's how they give us the feedback. So we ask these questions to our patient. We, we ask this question to our board. We ask this question to our patient advisory. We ask this question to our interpreters who we pick from the global communities who are coming from the communities. And the two questions that we ask is, how are we, three questions that we ask, how are we providing care? Will you come back to our clinic? And are you gonna refer your family and friends to the clinic? And we get 95 to 97, some, sometimes even 99%. And that tells um, how, how we are providing the care. Um, and, and they some uh, uh, we ask very like a provider specific question. What are the did your provider listen to you or not? Did they did they work with you or not? So those are the questions that help us in empowering our patients to be sitting on the driver's seat, so that we can modify our um, 
uh, care delivery, but also modify our behaviors, to be honest. Sure, sure. Um, Dr. Swetas, the next question is for you. Um, how have the current health circumstances affected your work and research? It seems like there is new challenges that come every day. Have you, been, how have you been able to cope with everything that's going on while also keeping up to date with current health policies? Oh my God, uh, where to start? Um, part, of, part of this is like defined current, current events, right? So for me, when, when I'm presenting sometimes pieces that, that I'm doing, or when I'm doing presentation, for example, about racism, I start talking about the state of affair, right? And where we were on this kind of bombardment, right, of layers. And sometimes people start thinking about COVID and then the murdering of Mr. Floyd in our backyard. And, and I usually say, that, think a little bit before that. And, and that's when I'm thinking about the anti-immigrant policies. And that, to me, was a pivotal moment in December 2006 when I saw the law, um, poverty law center reporting an increase on hate crime like 300%. And thinking about an aha moment, that was my aha moment. And I remember vividly because I was in the ICU with my mom, but I remember like something needs to be done. And, and it was so crucial, like somehow kind of it propelled me kind of to, to action. And, and maybe because we are providing and sometimes like we need to do something about it, right? Um, so that what pushed me to, I, I think to channel the thing that I have learned at the community level more, more, more in a translational way mm -hmm. and propel, that was the, 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 the beginning with the position paper saying like, we need a position paper that connect racism and health. Mm -hmm. And that was it, that was that moment. We were working on a position paper, I remember like if we were today, about how to increase access for uh, immigrant patients in your own state. And I'm like, forget about it, right? It will be useless. So we need something that physician can hold it. Um, and, but it's been intense. So it propels three years of amazing, intense work. And kind of like at the moment that, that all that work, it, when it was done, it's this bombardment right now like, that are macro traumatic events, right? Mm -hmm. For our community and macro traumatic events for us. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and I think this is something that we go from crisis to crisis, but then make the crisis part of the work that we do. Yeah, appreciate that answer. Dr. Westerhouse, a question here about um, understanding cultures and attitudes of the, first, of the patients that we serve. For those of us born in the US, it can be hard to know what is culturally appropriate for various groups, understanding, particularly in a center like yours. You see um, folks from different countries how can you make yourself ready to be culturally appropriate to all people that you work with? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, you know, I think the, the grounding principle for me, the thing that's I think universally gonna be appropriate is taking the time to listen to people and hear what their story is. Um, because we, we can get into some very problematic assuming if we start to think, well, folks from this country do X, Y, or Z, and um, people from this part of the world do this and that. And you know, some those generalizations may have some truth in them, but we know within any particular culture, there's a lot of individuality. So for me, it, it's one, trying to slow down, listen to people's stories, try and put together, like what is important for them? How do they understand health? I think as a health professional, it's also really important for us to acknowledge and name that in any particular clinical interaction, if it's me with another patient, there is far more than just one culture in the room, though. I think we get trained as health professionals thinking, well, I'm just thinking about like what the culture of the patient is. And we forget that the provider has a culture, biomedicine has a particular culture. And so I think it's very important to name and acknowledge that um, and recognize that, um, again, there are a lot, there's lots of cultural pieces that we need to be, like for me, it's helpful in listening to other people's stories to remember I have to like be doing a little bit of digger deeping on, digger, digger, um, <laughs> deeper digging on my own story 
And what are the assumptions that I have? Like, what is it about how, where I grew up in central Minnesota, like that put a frame on the world for me that if I don't pay attention to that, I'm probably missing something in this particular patient's story. So thank you. My mentor used to say that you have to always ask a question. What is my baggage? What baggage do I bring to this uh, discussion? Thank you for that. Um, Can I? Go ahead, please. It's just piggybacking because mm -hmm. I just love um, I, when you're talking about the culture, the culture that we bring as physicians uh, and again, the, the patient, who, kind of like, who's the patient, right? It's me patiently listen to what my patient has to say. I was just kind of thinking it's it's two things, right? One is this participatory flavor, right? Like global, local is two way, patient, physician is two way. So like we can teach our patient navigate healthcare, they can teach us to navigate their own culture. So when, when you have that lens uh, that it's participatory and you flatten the relationship, magic. And the other piece, that, that I, I, I just remember that definition, which is exactly what you, Michael, defined. is like being aware of the culture of oppression. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you don't need to be much aware about, oh, what do you eat? How do you sleep? What do you celebrate? More than understanding, like when you have a patient that belongs to a different culture, there's a culture of oppression because the system, everything around them has not been created thinking of them. And we as physicians represent, or again, kind of like that power, right? So be, being aware of that, love it. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, the flattening is I think key. And sometimes people look at culture as a fancy dress or some jewelry. They forget about the rest of it, including premises like the cultures of oppression and the institutional cultures that we're all part of. I really appreciate that. Um, here's a question for Dr. Duvedi. Um, are there, particular programs in the Twin Cities that you would recommend people get engaged in if they're interested in engaging in global local activities? Um, it, it, so for learning, um, I think um, Mike's program, the local global course that he runs, I, I, am a, I teach one of the session, that's a great program. Um, we have um, a local global um, program at Cook, but that's only for the residents at this time, especially things are really hard due to COVID. Um, but um, I think starting with volunteering, I think there are several, several places where people look for volunteering and that is the first step in on, on the ladder. So just knowing, just I, I think knowing is the first step and then you start building the network mm -hmm. and then you start working through that network because even though we are sitting here on this panel, believe me or not, we have a lot of learning to do. Uh, so we are always learning every single day. By no means, we, we have acquired some knowledge. I mean, at least I'm speaking for myself. We have acquired some knowledge over years, but I'm not the expert. And I don't think there are any experts. I think we all have, are in the learning field. So depending upon where you start, volunteering, networking, collaborating, asking questions. Uh, if you see a person being curious um, and uh, that those will be the way to go. Um, looking, doing the online searches, um, there are a lot of things that are available. The names that I um, said about the organizations, there are a lot of opportunities out there. Um, start with the volunteer and maybe who knows, person will be hired. So um, it's just, it's just, uh, there's a well-intended, uh, well-resourced resourced system in Minnesota. Um, there has to be just a curiosity need to be there. Sure. Uh, the next question uh, I'm gonna uh, ask Dr. Westerhaus, have you had any failures you can think of where you feel like you've done something good in engaging a community or a particular, uh, particular community and it's not worked well? Yes, many. Um, I, I mean, I, I can think of, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like there's the educational spaces, but then also just thinking about, um, clinical spaces and like our work at the center for international health. Um, you know, uh, there are, there's one, um, patient situation, which happened 
probably about was right when I started, but I, you know, it was just so revelatory for all of us and you wouldn't think it would be, but it just demonstrates how we can be so blindsided. And it was a, a guy um, who was originally from Somalia who had type two diabetes and um, he was pulled over. Uh, he was on 35 W just a little bit south of the Twin Cities and was pulled over and was found to have a, a blood sugar that was, he was driving erratically and was found to have an extremely low blood sugar. And it turns out that he had just been seen in clinic, um, I think a week or two before. And our, at that point in time, our clinical large like health system didn't have anything in place for really being proactive about um, folks getting ready for Ramadan and getting ready to fast. And so he had this visit that was like a week or two before Ramadan, his medicines were changed. He was put on medicines that drove his blood sugars down extremely low in the setting of fasting. And, um, you know, that, that, that's an example of um, not paying attention to the larger dynamics in people's lives. And thankfully, we use that as an opportunity to really learn in our clinic, but also in the whole health system in which our clinic operates, in which now people are routinely called a month ahead of time if they identify as um, likely to practice um, fasting during Ramadan, and we have proactive visits with people. So that, that, that's one amongst many failures where you're constantly being humbled and recognizing, as, as all have said, how much learning we have to do. And I think all of us have stories like that that are, unfortunately, I wish there were less stories, but no, we, every time it's a new, uh, a new revelation. Uh, Dr. Swetas, here's a question for you. Youth, particularly youth of color, have unique challenges within their own communities, but they're often dismissed as not being recognized as important assets. As adults and as advocates for health and health equity, how can we help to elevate the voices of youth and to recognize them as important community members and important assets? Oh, sorry, Vero, can you unmute? <laughs> Today is my day. <laughs> this whole time, my doggy was coming in and out, so I need to mute and unmute. Here I am, so, so sorry. Uh, Look at the leaders, look who's transforming our communities. Look at who's created Black Lives Matter. Look at climate change, who has been uh, leading these issues. Look at um, Standing Rock, 19 year old. And again, most of them fighting depression and sadness, both Greta and this 18 year old, the Malala. Look at them, they are the one change in the society. So how can, you see that, like to me, I'm, I'm biased on the other way. I see so much their strengths that, that it's difficult for me. Kind of, I'm looking at the other, I'm like, how come? Like, what else do you need? <laughs> so, but, but I get the question, right? And so part of that, it's um, keeping, we need to keep showing that there's a bias there. Yep. That, that there's a bias and when there's like fast and when you see that passion, it comes because they're like forging their identity and they are claiming for, for the world to be heard and, and for that to be accepted so that, that they are the main ones to use that passion and, and themselves saying like, how can you guys adults are not fixing these, these things that you have in the society? So um, I am blessed to have been trained in a specialty that trains you to see strengths and not just to show them. And then with the motivation and interview and kind of like affirming to them, like, see, that's you. And that goes so perfectly well with health equity because that's exactly the same thing like, like you are doing, right? Like recognizing that communities and youth have strengths and we are there just in this moment just to affirm them, like how, how much knowledge and, and lessons they bring to our society. So I think like as, as long as we keep repeating that, right? And, and showing the proof. I think that's a beautiful lesson in itself because quite often in healthcare, we, we are trained to look at deficits, not assets. And you know, in global health, we talk these days about the importance of asset-based approaches rather than, oh, those poor people have nothing kind of a conversation. So totally. I, yep. Um, Here's a question. Um, this is 
partly a challenge that we're going to face. Um, how do you build trust uh, from a very practical way towards the COVID vaccine? I mean, there have been stories of immigrant communities that have been distrustful of vaccines and things like that. Um, what are the steps we should be doing? And this is probably true beyond immigrant communities because you are hearing stories of vaccine hesitancy amongst native born US communities too. Do you, do you want me to answer that question? Please, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think the key is um, making sure that the right people are um, at the table um, when the decisions are being moved forward. Um, so the right, the right questions are being asked. asked. So the, when the trials are happening, uh, making sure that the communities and different communities are involved and engaged in asking the question, in looking at the informed consent, looking at what is in the vaccine, looking at what is the travel is like, what, like uh, what kind of trial is happening, how big the trial is happening, how long the travel trial is gonna happen, what are the things that will, they will be monitoring. For those period of the times, how the communities will be engaged in processing the information and educating the communities. Um, and the, I can speak of that because I am asking those questions. Um, um, I know Minnesota Department of Health is doing a lot of work. Um, I'm engaged with them. Um, I know there are two big, there's a big trials going on. So we are asking all these questions and, and, and the lens that I am bringing is that making sure that we are representing um, uh, when I'm saying the communities, I'm not saying picking a dock and putting it at the table person who is gonna who is in the community living and has a question and does not get the opportunity to ask the question should be at the table so i think that will be one thing and then the second will be um uh, if we are talking about um different um uh, like a global communities um, i'm working with different like uh, religious leaders um to ask questions how do we frame the question making sure that it is um the information is written at, at, a, at a reading level where it is understandable because in medical society, we use a lot of jargon and like a technical languages and the wording, which is not understandable. So I think all those questions, um, it, it is gonna be hard. Um, it's not impossible. It's gonna be a long journey, but I think these steps are measures if at, are at the places, there's a hope that it will be successful. And in many ways, we are hoping to capture some of those lessons learned. We are uh, creating a new center within our center, which is going to be a resource center for refugees, immigrants, and migrant populations, and, and maybe broadcast best practices to all health departments in the country. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to take any more questions live because of the time. Uh, please, I, I will respond to those questions by email, the ones who have already asked the questions. But I'll bring, like to bring the panelists back in um, and reflect on today's conversation. Um, what are important ideas or concepts that you have gained or learned or emphasized in today's conversation? Dr. Vestras, I'm gonna start with you there. Yeah, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna answer, but I've just been taking notes from all the really insightful things that have been, been said and a, a couple of words stand out for me. That I have circled on my paper. One is the word belonging um, and just really thinking about that. Finding ways not to reinvent the wheel. Um, I think as, as a physicians are not the, the humblest of folks all the time and just recognizing that there's a lot of people doing really good and important work that needs to be lifted up. Um, and then the other word is just yeah, culture and how important that is and in the ways that culture can be oppressive and, the, and making sure we're taking time to just celebrate the ways that culture brings wellness, resilience, wisdom, um, and how much we can learn from that. As assets, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Suetas? I've been, see, I'm unmuted now. So I've been thinking a lot about participatory and how the, in, in most of the pieces that we have been talking, it's always like this idea, even, even on the question about how we bring the youth, right? If, if we're working with youth, they need to lead what we are doing, not us. If anything has to be kind of like with the community at the same level, 
And when you're using these participatory processes, even in research, in education, in patient care, that's sort of like the answer. That's that's the pedagogy of the oppressor. And when you and when you look at kind of like Paulo Freire, what has done for education is that liberating truth that helps no matter where we are positioned to to help activate someone, not activate, show them like the they have the power to do anything that they can do. Um, so that's my, my reflection for the night. I'm energized, thank you for that. <laughs> Dr. Mehdi, how about you? Um, when I was listening, um, the things that I can think of that the community is the expert, mm. um, um, making sure that we have reflective practices in place and um, lifelong mutual learning. Thank you. That's beautiful. Um, thank you, folks, for uh, participating, my panelists. This has been fantastic. There is a word I'd like to use. This is from Sanskrit. It's called satsang, which means the company of the great, or the company of the good. And I felt like I've created satsang today. Uh, next week, we have a mini medical school panel on global health research, the importance of global collaboration to battle global threats. I would strongly encourage um, today's listeners to look at a Canvas course for more resources. Dr. Westerhaus has curated some. Dr. Duvedi and Dr. Swetas have also contributed some resources. Please access the Canvas course for more information. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention, we talked a lot about social determinants of health. We also strongly believe that these social determinants of health are significantly depend on the politics. So this year, our annual Qui Peterson lecture on October 26th is going to be on the political determinants of health. And our speakers are Professor Ilana Kikush from the University of Geneva, Professor Daniel Doss, who wrote the book on the political determinants of health from Morehouse College. And Dr. Laura Bloomberg will join me in moderating a session, a question and answer with Dr. Doss. Thank you again. Really appreciate you joining us. Looking forward to you joining us next week. Bye now. Thank you.